whenever you think about breathing and breathing can be very, very confusing. Um, there's so many different breathing exercises, you know, should you be doing something like the Wim Hof method, which is hyperventilation and long breath tolls? Should you be doing breathe light? Should be, should you be breathing through the nose? Should you be breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth? Should you be taking these full breaths or breathing with good recruitment of the diaphragm? And it goes on, you know, so there's, there's a massive variance in different breathing exercises that you can practice. I find it helpful when I'm working with my students to look at breathing from a number of different dimensions. So if somebody presents you with a breathing exercise, you have to ask the question, what's this breathing exercise doing to breathing from a biochemical dimension? If the breathing exercise involves breathing less air, well, it's increasing carbon dioxide in the blood, which will slightly drop blood pH, and exposure to increased CO2 can help to improve the body's tolerance of the gas carbon dioxide could be very, very important. The breathing technique, it may involve hyperventilation, which in turn is going to get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide from the lungs and from the blood, and this drives up blood pH, and this causes arousal of the central nervous system, including the brain. So we have increased neuronal excitability as a result of hyperventilation because carbon dioxide is a calming gas, and this is known, you know, I think... Since 1924, when researchers looked at individuals with epilepsy and they found that the inhalation of carbon dioxide in the correct dose, it had a positive effect in terms of reducing the risk of the individual having an epileptic seizure. So, yeah, so coming back to breathing. So you can look at breathing from a biochemical dimension. But you can also look at breathing then, what's it doing from a biomechanical dimension? So a biomechanical dimension is referring to whether we are breathing high or whether we are breathing low. Now, of course, the objective is to breathe low with good recruitment of the diaphragm. There's two aspects here. One is the function of the diaphragm. So during inspiration, the diaphragm is moving downwards. But during expiration, we do need the diaphragm to move back up to its resting position because it's the movement of the diaphragm back up to its resting position, which in turn is going to influence the inhalation. It's also the movement of the diaphragm back up to its resting position, which influences what's called the zone of apposition. And it's the zone of apposition which is influencing intra-abdominal pressure. So the stabilization that the diaphragm provides to the spine, which is necessary for functional movement, is influenced by the free movement of the diaphragm and the movement of the diaphragm back to its resting position. So when you think about breathing exercise, ask yourself the question, is it doing anything to the breath from a biomechanical dimension? So there's two aspects. You've got the function, but you also have the strength of the diaphragm. A stronger diaphragm is better because if your diaphragm is strong, you're less likely then to have respiratory muscle fatigue. And um, you can imagine an athlete, and it's not just a sprinter, it's an endurance athlete as well, many of them can be prone to fatigue of the diaphragm. And when the diaphragm gets tired, of course, other functions of the body will be sacrificed in order to maintain breathing. And what happens is when the diaphragm gets tired, blood is stolen from the legs to feed the diaphragm, and then the athlete will have to slow down or cease exercise. So it's actually very important to train your breathing muscles. Okay, so there's two aspects of breathing. Then we look at the psychophysiological aspect of breathing, and we're asking ourselves the question, what is this breathing technique doing? Is it increasing sympathetic drive? Is it increasing a stress response? Or is it helping to downregulate? Is it stimulating the vagus nerve? Is it causing the heart rate to slow down? And that's breathing. You know, every breathing exercise that comes your way, ask yourself the question, what is this breathing exercise doing from a biochemical dimension? Is it hyperventilation or is it hypoventilation? What's it doing from a biomechanical dimension? Is it helping to improve the function of the diaphragm and the strength of the diaphragm? What's it doing in terms of the autonomic nervous system? Is it causing a stress response or is it activating the body's relaxation response? So every breathing exercise, if you understand about breathing and more importantly, if you are teaching breathing exercises, I think it's really important that you understand what the breathing exercise that you're teaching actually is doing with your students.
because you know there's some students that yes up regulation can be important but many students down regulation is very important and many students have poor breathing from a biomechanical point of view or from a biochemical point of view or both so as an instructor it's very important that you hone in on this if we are going to teach breathing we should understand what the breathing exercise that we are teaching what really is it doing